As the five of you that actually watch the Celtic Myths videos will know, there is no shortage of superstition in Scotland. And when you're dealing with a culture that believes in wacky stuff like furries that enjoy fishing or nocturnal little dudes that do your chores, it shouldn't come as a surprise that there are those of us out there that believe in ghosts. But ghosts need a little bit of help on their way through to this mortal plane, which is where mediums come in. They act like middlemen between our world and the afterlife. They say that dead men can't talk, and many people are killed to keep their secrets safe. So you can imagine the trouble that it would cause when ghosts start blotting out military secrets during the bloodiest conflict in history, as well as how far the government is willing to go to stop the medium that's making all of this information public. We, of course, know that mediums are... A lot of nonsense, right? They're, they're charlatans, none of it's real. But that doesn't stop them from trying to ply their trade and deceive people. But sometimes you get mediums who shamelessly take their lies way too far to the point where it just becomes absolutely hilarious. The last witch in Scotland, Helen Duncan. video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video was brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an easy to use online learning community with hundreds of different classes to discover and master or just to improve your skills. Whether you are a beginner, intermediate or an expert, there is always something new for you to learn. Skillshare can help you better yourself, it can help you to grow and make connections through communal creative outlets. Who doesn't want to learn more and improve themselves, if that is you, then Skillshare will help you with that goal. The weekend is a great time to de-stress and for me that means gardening. Yes, I actually do love gardening. Shut up. There is always something new to learn with gardening, so I took a class to maximise the amount of space I have for growing plants and food, while also learning more about pest control. I took a class by Sustainable Stace called Vision, Sketch and Prep, Tiny Garden Beds, Backyard Abundance, Part 1. It was a really good class that shows how much you can grow in such a small space, which is helpful knowledge for people these days who might not even have a garden in the first place. I like Skillshare because it gives you the chance to learn whenever you want to, with no stress and you can learn whatever you want at your own pace. Skillshare even has career focused classes like video editing, photography and illustration. Skillshare is offering one month free to any of my viewers that use the link in the description box down below. But for the month of April only, they are running an even better offer. If you're ready to start learning today with Skillshare, you can get 40% off of your first year by using my link. So I'll leave both links down below so you can choose the offer that's best for you. Victoria Helen McRae McFarlane was born in Callander, Perthshire on the 25th of November 1897. While most mad lads, or in this case mad lassies, tend to grow into their defining traits, Helen had the gift from a very early age and very often drew the ire of her family and those around her by making little predictions that would inexplicably come true. Nothing big like Jotapata will fall on the 47th day or anything like that, but small things that made Helen kinda creepy and earned her the nickname Hellish Nell. Things such as thinking about the number 1066 and then her teacher later having a heart attack as soon as he wrote that number on the blackboard during a history lesson or praying for answers that she didn't know during an exam, and then the answers appearing in handwriting that wasn't hers. Helen's family were so freaked out by this that her mother had her tested by a doctor, who found nothing. And then Helen told the doctor not to go out that night. 
Unfazed by a teenage girl probably talking out of her arse, the doctor did go out that night, and he died in a car accident during a snowstorm. This didn't reflect well on Helen's family, and it, alongside a lack of local jobs, was part of the reason why they actually kicked Helen out of the house at the age of just 16. Since it wasn't a good look in those days for the local minister to be accusing your daughter of consorting with the devil. Despite this treatment, Helen wasn't alone in her voodoo nonsense for very long. At the age of 20, Helen married a cabinet maker named Henry Duncan, who reportedly greeted her by saying, So we meet at last, when they first met because they both claimed to have had visions of each other before crossing paths. Yeah, Henry fully supported Helen's witchy bullshit, which is just as well because he gave her so much ectoplasm that they ended up having six kids that he looked after as a stay-at-home father. He couldn't work much because he suffered from arthritis and a weak heart after being kicked out of the military during World War I. So, Helen had to be the one to bring the money in. So, she scraped together a living in a bleach factory. However, this was only a part-time job, and Helen spent the rest of her time in the spiritual church scene, where she gained enough clout to become a minister. And it was at this point that Helen found her true calling. With Henry acting as her manager, Helen started carrying out seances in the 1920s, in which she would sit in a cabinet behind a closed curtain, fall into a trance, and call forth the spirits of her bereft customers' recently departed loved ones. But while that's the extent of most mediums' mediuming, Helen was special. She had the gift. She couldn't just let the spirits speak through her. Oh, no, 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 no. She could physically manifest the spirits so that they could speak for themselves. How the hell could she do that? I hear you ask. Well, (laughs) strap yourselves in. Once Helen was in the trance, a cloudy substance known as ectoplasm would come (laughs) in. Would would come out of her nose or mouth and condense and condense into a ghost. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Would <laughs> <clears throat> uh, condense into a ghost, which was one of her two spirit guides named Peggy and Albert. <laughs> These. These spirit guides then took the lead in passing on messages from the great beyond. <laughs> and all of this all of this went on with the lights turned off, leaving only a dim red light to illuminate the room. Because of that, and Helen working her magic while obscured by a curtained box, you might be thinking that all of this sounds a little bit Wizard of Oz. And you would be right, because while she was spitting a lot of things out of her mouth, facts were not among them. She got almost everything wrong. In 1929, a paranormal investigator with the National Laboratory of Psychical Research named Harry Price heard about Helen, and he was immediately suspicious. So he started to investigate her over the subsequent months. But he noticed that even though the spiritualists, including Helen, were carrying out the seances in the very same building that he worked in, he wasn't allowed to watch. Not only was he not invited, but even when he asked if he could attend, he was flat out told no. But nevertheless, Price was an expert in the arcane and black arts. (laughs) Sorry, it's my awful Matt Berry impression. He was still determined to get to the bottom of this witchy woman's wittering. However, it wasn't until 1931 that Price managed a breakthrough in his investigation. Helen's husband actually approached Price and offered him the chance to watch Helen carry out a seance, probably seeing it as an opportunity to vindicate his wife's talents and generate some positive press. For the low, low price of 50 old-timey pounds, the fee was reluctantly agreed, and the examination began on May the 4th. 
but the force was not with Helen at all. Price only had to take one single look at the scene for him to figure out exactly what was going on, including what the famous ectoplasm was really made of. To quote Price's casebook on the subject, the medium having donned her special garments, she was led into the seance room by Professor McDougall and myself, and placed in the curtained recess known as the cabinet. In a few seconds, the medium was in a trance, and within a minute, the cabinet curtains parted, and we beheld the medium covered from head to foot with cheesecloth. There appeared to be yards of it. Some of it was trailing on the floor, one end was poked up her nostril, a piece was issuing from her mouth. Yeah, Helen's big party trick was basically she could swallow and regurgitate cheesecloth. But, just to be sure, Price did obtain a sample of the stuff for the purpose of eventually reverse engineering his own recipe. However, Helen did not make it easy for him, and the struggle to procure the stuff sounded like quite a hoot, as Price put it himself. The sight of half a dozen men, each with a pair of scissors, waiting for the word, was amusing. It came, and we all jumped. One of the doctors got hold of the stuff and secured the piece. The medium screamed, and the rest of the teleplasm went down her throat. This time, it wasn't cheesecloth. It proved to be paper soaked in white of egg and folded into a flattened tube. Often, the ectoplasm would also have ghostly appendages attached to the ends to really sell the whole cloudy matter coalescing into an apparition vibe, such as faces cut out from magazines or fucking rubber gloves. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry for that. That is one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. That is the dumbest, dumbest thing I've ever seen. I can't tell what's more embarrassing. The fact that Helen tried to trick people with this, this absolute blatant bullshit, or the fact that in some cases it actually worked. Despite having been paid what is worth over four grand today to reveal her secrets, Helen didn't take too kindly to Price's attempts to x-ray her as part of the examination, though you can probably guess why. Helen got out of it by just going absolutely hysterical and running out into the street, where only her husband managed to restrain her. And then, Henry later refused to empty his pockets or submit to a search. Price was quick to speculate the obvious. Henry had taken the ectoplasm from Helen and hid it. But the embarrassingly amateur stagecraft doesn't end there, because I haven't shown you Helen's spirit guides yet. In 1928, a photographer named Harvey Metcalf managed to snap some pictures, and I'm just going to leave this on the screen for a minute. Just look, look at that. Look at that. James Cameron and wet a workshop. Eat your fucking hearts out. What in the blue paper mache art attack fuck is this supposed to be? As a puppet made out of paper mache mask and sheet, I would say that it's more Henson than haunted if it wasn't for the fact that it's so egregiously obvious that it couldn't even have scared Michael Caine. I mean, anyone who believes something this stupid is clearly fucking gonzo. Only an absolute muppet would fall for this. If the fact that the true nature of Helen's powers isn't abundantly obvious to you yet for whatever fucking reason, I'll let Price himself give you the conclusion of his study. And I must say that I was deeply impressed. I was impressed with the brazen effrontery that prompted the Duncans to come to my laboratory in an attempt to put over their stuff on our experts. I was impressed with the amazing credulity of the spiritualists who had sat with the Duncans for six solid months, and the fact that they had advertised her phenomena as genuine. Basically, Helen's bullshit was so obviously fake that Price was actually impressed 
that she still tried to push it anyway. Price had outed Helen as a complete fucking fraud. And the word spread quickly as the results of other investigations started to come out. That same year, the London Spiritualist Alliance examined ectoplasm samples that all turned out to be either cheesecloth or paper mixed with egg whites. They then called Helen's bluff by getting her to swallow a methylene blue tablet before the seance. And you'll never guess what happened. She didn't produce any ectoplasm. People began to denounce Helen in droves, including the Morning Post and the London Psychic Laboratory. The heat was so bad that even some of her fellow morons turned on her. However, somehow all of this ultimately only ended up being good advertising for Helen, as her services were in more demand than ever due to her clash with the scientists. Because spiritualists are fucking idiots. Who needs facts and logic when you have cheesecloth? But in January of 1933, the spiritualists were unable to cope for much longer, because an audience member seeing the opportunity to further prove that Helen was a fraud actually grabbed Helen's puppet during a seance and tore it, proving that it wasn't a ghost, it was just some piece of shit cobbled together from the contents of her drawers. As a result, Helen was prosecuted in Edinburgh that May for being a fraudulent medium. She was fined £10 and jailed for a month. Guess the spirits didn't warn her about that. You would think that a fraud conviction in an actual court of law would have been the final nail in the coffin for Helen's career. But you would be wrong. She just found a different group of morons to swindle. A local church in Portsmouth invited Helen to demonstrate her abilities in 1941. So she started to do seances there. And she did an awful lot of them. Because you see, Portsmouth was a critically important dockyard for the Royal Navy. And by this point, World War II was in full swing. So thanks to the demand from anxious and grief-stricken relatives of sailors in the area who were so desperate that they wanted spiritual help to keep their loved ones safe, business was booming in Portsmouth almost as much as it was in Clyde Bank. As Helen got to work, she immediately got herself into trouble when she summoned the spirit of a dead sailor. In November of 1941, Helen called up the ghost of a sailor named Sid, who told her about the sinking of a ship named HMS Barham, which had been torpedoed by a German U-boat. But the thing is that the sinking of this ship wasn't actually announced until the following January, because the government kept it secret to mislead the Germans and keep up morale at home. So Helen had just blotted out a really big military secret. Upon hearing this, the Navy immediately went, how the fuck did she know that? And they instantly went after her, out of fear that she would spill even more military secrets, like the date, time and location of the D-Day landings that they were planning. One Navy lieutenant suspected that Helen was a fraud, so he decided to do a little bit of undercover sleuthing and bought two tickets to her show for 25 shillings each. And what he saw could only be described as very, very sloppy on Helen's part, because during the seance, a ghost revealed itself as that same lieutenant's dead aunt. A dead aunt who never existed. Later on, Helen then summoned another ghost, which was the ghost of this lieutenant's dead sister. But while he actually did have a sister, she wasn't dead. The lieutenant was so incensed by this trick that he knew he had to do something to stop Helen. So, who are you going to call? The cops, because ghosts aren't real. The cops soon started their own investigation, and then, during a seance on the 19th of January 1944, it was go time. A plainclothes officer that was hiding in the audience revealed himself and blew a whistle to alert the other cops waiting outside to start the raid. He then made a grab for the ectoplasm, but Helen... <laughs> 
<laughs> snorted it back in before he could get a sample of what he could clearly see was just a sheet. Nevertheless, the raid ended with the arrest of Helen and three members of the audience. Helen was charged under Section 4 of the Vagrancy Act of 1824. Such was the procedure for fortune tellers, astrologers and spiritualists, which meant that she was facing a maximum penalty of five shillings. However, given the sensitive nature of some of the stuff she was saying and the Navy's concern with intelligence leaks, that charge was soon upgraded to conspiracy. And if convicted, well, getting convicted of conspiracy during a war, well, let's just say that Helen would very soon get to meet the spirits in person. But the charges changed as Helen's case got yanked all the way up the chain to the Old Bailey resulting in Helen being charged under Section 4 of the Witchcraft Act of 1735, which was the first prosecution under this law in over a century. Now, to be very, very clear, this was not a literal witch trial, which is how many modern witches like to portray it. The Witchcraft Act wasn't a law against witches, but a law against claiming that someone had supernatural abilities in order to defraud or mislead someone. Like, saying you can make magic potions that cure all diseases, only 10 shillings a bottle, but then it turns out it's just some daffodil petals and Coca-Cola. It was to stop people from getting conned. It was essentially the law that abolished witch hunts and attempted to stamp out belief in witches. Sadly, it failed. Four waves of feminism later, and this is what women choose to do with their rights. What a waste. But anyway, the government was so out to get Helen that they were dusting off some really old legal tomes. And for good measure, Helen was also charged under the Larceny Act for falsely pretending that she was in a position to bring about the appearances of the spirits or deceased persons for financial gain. Helen's week-long trial attracted quite a bit of media attention, with newspapers publishing cartoons of witches on broomsticks like there was no tomorrow. This ended up bringing the case to the attention of a bunch of enraged spiritualists who rallied behind Helen. They even raised a defence fund, and I'd be really interested to see how those dumb fucking proto-hippies tricked their husbands into giving them money to defend this utter clown. The spiritualists also provided a legion of witnesses who gave evidence, if you want to call it that. Such as one client who testified to having seen his dead wife emerging from the ectoplasm, and then asking him and his sister-in-law to stand up. After they obliged, the dead wife then allegedly took off her wedding ring and put it on her sister's finger while saying, it is my wish that this takes place for the sake of my little girl. A year later, the guy had married his dead wife's sister, and when they saw Helen again afterwards, the dead wife appeared again and allegedly blessed both of them. Now, we've already gone over the myriad of reasons why this is completely absurd, but I also can't personally imagine anyone, dead or alive, cucking themselves. And I especially can't imagine anyone telling their spouse to fuck their sister. I think this guy was just sick of people judging him for nailing his dead wife's sister, and he saw an opportunity to tell the public, well, actually, the ghost of my dead wife said it was okay. The defence presented 49 witnesses, all with similar testimonies, including a client that claimed to have seen the ghost of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, because, yeah, sure, fuck it, why not? If you're going to take the piss, you might as well have some fun with it. But this high number of witnesses was actually part of the defence's plan to just keep flooding the courtroom with nutcases to wear the judge down, so that the judge would eventually agree to let Helen actually carry out a seance in the courtroom to demonstrate her abilities. And it worked. The judge offered the jury the chance to actually see Helen do a seance. However, the defence's gambit was quickly thwarted because the jury just went, no. 
the jury were just absolutely sick of this shit and they just wanted to go home to their families which is understandable after having been dragged all the way to London from Portsmouth for a week long trial that kept being interrupted by bombings because the blitz was happening all around them adding a seance to the proceedings would have just added more time to the whole ordeal a lot more than the jury were willing to spend so the jury just said no and this was probably for the best because putting on a display like that in the old Bailey of all places, surrounded by people that weren't absolutely bananas, would have been extremely fucking embarrassing. But it also would have been absolutely hilarious, so I'm actually kind of disappointed that it wasn't allowed. The prosecution then tried to call Helen as a witness for cross-examination, but the defence shot that down because she was actually in a trance during her seances and therefore couldn't recall what was said or done. My, how convenient. Helen was so committed to the bit that she was found to have owned an HMS Barham hatband that was apparently left behind by the sailor's ghost. However, what Helen didn't seem to realise was that sailors' hatbands didn't actually have the ship names on them. And this is where we get to the elephant in the room. How did Helen actually know about the sinking of the HMS Barham? Well, it's because it probably wasn't as much of a secret as the government wanted it to be. Well, you would think that the secret could be contained because only the casualties' families were told and all of them were told to keep their mouths shut, but the total number of families told was 862. 862 families. So, a few thousand people at least knew about the sinking. And for the secret to get out, all it takes is one to open their mouth. Or to post it in a Discord somewhere. And the secret is not really a secret if at least a few thousand people know about it. Also, these families have mums, sisters, aunties, etc. So it should be pretty obvious that when all of the men are off fighting and the country is full of more women than ever, secrets just don't exist anymore because women fucking gossip. So Helen probably just heard about the HMS Barnum sinking through the grapevine as local gossip. At the end of Helen's trial, the jury took only half an hour to convict her under the Witchcraft Act, though the other charges were dropped. This made her the second last person to ever be convicted under the Witchcraft Act and the last to be jailed under it. She was then sentenced to nine months in Holloway Prison and, quite controversially, was not allowed to appeal her sentence to the House of Lords. Despite Helen's crimes being quite minor, albeit pretty ghoulish, she was treated extra harshly because she was still deemed a bit of a national security risk. D-Day was coming up, so the spooks were extra spooked about any potential leaks that could give the game away, regardless of how small the risk. So, they wanted Helen kept the fuck out of the way until they could get the party started. However, Helen found a lot more mercy on the inside than she did in the courtroom. Helen's cell door was apparently never locked and by all accounts she was treated rather well because a large swathe of the population believed that she had fallen victim to a miscarriage of justice. She even continued to ply her trade to other prisoners, staff and the many people that came to visit, including Winston Churchill. Yes, Churchill had a bit of a spiritual streak as a result of the Boer War. While he was on the run after escaping capture, he felt like he was being guided by something supernatural that brought him to safety. Upon hearing about Helen, Churchill declared that the whole trial was fucking stupid and wrote a memo demanding a report on the Witchcraft Act, in which he called the whole affair obsolete tomfoolery and he saw it as just a massive waste of the court's time and resources. I mean, they did go a little bit overboard, but Helen did still deserve to go down for fraud. After serving six months of her sentence, Helen was released from prison on the 22nd of September 1944, and she vowed never to give another seance. 
And considering what we know about Helen's integrity, it shouldn't surprise you that she almost immediately went back on this promise, claiming to have felt a strong call from the spirit world. The quality, if you could call it that, of the seances then declined, with fellow spiritualists turning against her and the spiritualist governing body actually withdrawing her diploma. That's right, Helen was such a blatant fake that even her fellow lunatics were disavowing her. And with her reputation deeper in the gutter than ever, Helen just couldn't catch a break for the rest of her life. In November of 1956, a seance in Nottingham was raided, with the cops strip-searching her and carrying out a lot of flash photography. This raid ultimately proved to be career-ending for Helen. Not because she was outed as a fraud again, but because, allegedly, she was seriously injured by the ectoplasm shooting back inside her too fast after her trance was interrupted. According to... Well, lunatics, the light touching the ectoplasm from the flash photography, you know, touching the fucking cheesecloth, apparently caused some type of spiritual reaction. You know, so apparently light deals 48 psychic damage whenever it touches cheesecloth. Personally, I think the cardinal sin of dealing with mediums and trances is allowing them to carry on exploiting the grieving and emotionally vulnerable for money. But, what do I know? Helen was then rushed back home to Edinburgh after she was hit by the backfiring ectoplasm that, according to her fellow lunatics, left her with two second degree burns on her stomach. And it seemed that Helen did actually have an injury or something wrong with her, because five weeks later, she died on the 6th of December 1956 at the age of 59. Now, I'm not a doctor, but that cause of death sounds a little bit insane, and the non-nutcase community seem to agree. Now, maybe she did actually sustain some kind of injury from snorting the cheesecloth back up far too fast, or maybe she already had an existing stomach problem. But the general consensus was that Helen was just really unhealthy. She was actually so fat that she couldn't function properly, to the point where even just moving around wasn't really a strong suit. So yeah, it turned out that Helen wasn't really a medium, but an extra large. Even though Helen was nothing more than a shameless hack, her public persona ended up doing a lot for the spiritualist movement. But, as we just discussed, that movement was purely metaphorical. As a result of the trial, the Witchcraft Act was repealed in 1951, and it was replaced with the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Three years later, spiritualism as a whole was officially recognised as a real religion, and the absolute state of women has never been the same again. To this day, these dipshits are doing their bit to give back to their brave leader who sacrificed her freedom and reputation for them. They are fighting in Helen's corner and campaigning for the pardons of Helen and all other mediums like her that they believe were wrongfully convicted under the Witchcraft Act due to misogynistic persecution. And it's going about as well as you would expect. Petitions to posthumously pardon Helen have failed as recently as 2008 and 2012, with a Holyrood Petitions Committee member saying... I feel we've got better things to talk about. <laughs> and it's an interesting lesson in history, but it has no purpose whatsoever, and I would like to close it now. I'm honestly, I'm honestly quite surprised that the Scottish government didn't bend over backwards to accommodate these idiots for victim points. But it's not just Helen's rabid supporters that are keeping her legacy going. We can't even get rid of the woman herself. A number of mediums have claimed to have communed with Helen from the other side, because of course they fucking have. Her own daughter even allegedly had a chat with her in the 80s, and her grandchildren eagerly inherited the grift and are still trying to clear Helen's name, while insisting that Helen's gift was real. Look, we can debate where we go after we die until the cows come home. Maybe there's something, maybe there isn't. But one thing that the vast majority of us can all agree on is there is no communing with the dead. That's it. The end. Your ticket's punched. Press F. Do not pass go. That's all, folks. Goodbye. When we enter the halls of Mandos, we are not coming back. 
Some people did come back from the halls of Mandor, so that's a bad example. But it is a sad fact of life, and I know how hard it is to come to terms with in the moment, but we can't move on with our lives and our grief until we do. And all Helen ever did was completely wreck the grieving process of her victims, not clients, victims, by selling them false hope in the form of spiritual snake oil, and even worse, literally puppeteering the dead for profit. All of the idiots that are into all of this pretentious new age voodoo nonsense because they're so nihilistic that they want their own immortal souls sold back to them as products that they can vapidly consume because they think they're too good for real religion, they just love the fact that Helen was so hard done by for simply helping people connect with their loved ones, but I think she wasn't treated harshly enough. Fuck her. Fuck Helen Duncan. Mediums literally prey on people's grief. She was a soulless grifter that preyed on heartbroken people who were at their most vulnerable. Sure, it's easy to clown on our victims for believing in such nonsense in the first place, but when you are that distraught, you will take any helping hand that comes your way. Even if that helping hand is made of rubber and wrapped in cheesecloth and dangling out of a dumb bitch's mouth, seriously, how the fuck did this fool anyone? I get that national security is important and D-Day was kind of a big deal, but the Navy were so ridiculously paranoid and overzealous in going after Helen Duncan that they accidentally made her a martyr, when her memory being co-signed to oblivion is the least that she deserved. And despite decades of hysteria, I think that Harry Price hit the nail right on the head at the beginning of the entire ordeal, when he said... Could anything be more infantile than a group of grown-up men wasting time, money and energy on the antics of a fat female crook? It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody says, subscribe!